Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, we're going to do a quick um, operability in heart disease. I think mostly NH guys know a lot of this. But anyway, we'll start with um, issue of operability. I think, you know, a lot of times we say four month old, six or three years. But in general, in infants who are less than six months of age, you can make the assumption that they are operable. Because it's very unusual to get irreversible pulmonary vascular disease at six months or less. Uh, do you know which kind of patient you would be worried about PVOD, let's say in a four month old? What kind of patient, what diagnosis, what disease would you be worried in about irreversibility? Anyone? Normally in a three month old, four month old, five month old, you're not worried about operability. You're sure, okay. We close the VSD and they'll do fine. But in which type of, let's say you have a VSD patient that you're worried about. You have a regular VSD, but you're worried that this patient has earlier pulmonary vascular damage than you expect. It's true, yes. Trunkers and AP windows, CDAs, all of them have to be operated earlier. But let's say you have a straightforward large VSD, four months old, and he's looking inoperable to you. What can be the cause? What is the diagnosis? Anyone heard of non-regression, non-regression of fetal pulmonary vascular resistance. So there is one entity, uh, rare cases have been described where the high pulmonary resistance of birth never regresses. So those babies never go into heart failure, they never have wet rest, suck cycles, they, are, they just come out with a loud C2 and just stay with severe pulmonary hypertension and high PDR throughout. So their pulmonary resistance never drops. So this is a separate entity which is called non-regression of fetal pulmonary resistance. And how do you make that diagnosis of non-regression of fetal PDR? I don't think it's so high an incidence. It's, uh, it's, it's really, you see it in kind of one out of a thousand patients. Uh, but how do you make that diagnosis? Where this specific heart failure uh, has good weight gain and yet he has a large VSD and high PDR at a very young age. So how can you prove it? Actually lung biopsy. Because lung biopsy will show that he already has, uh, you know, the media state, he's already got features of PVOD on his uh, lung biopsy. Uh, and he's only four months old or two months old or three months old. So it's something to suspect in a two-month-old or three-month-old who never have a heart failure but has a large VSD. But otherwise, in general, in most infants, they go into heart failure, they have a you know, pulmonary resistance drop, and generally till six months, mostly till one year, they remain operable. So when I talk today, I'm basically going to right now focus on large VSD because of course canals and so on are a different subgroup. So now, what is the pulmonary artery pressure in a large VSD? Let us say the blood pressure is 100 by 60. What is the pulmonary artery pressure? In a large VSD, no pulmonary stenosis. What will be the pulmonary artery pressure in a one-day-old baby? 60. So it's going to be the same, right? It's going to be 100. So the systolic blood pressure will be 100. And the diastolic blood pressure will be what? Let's say 20, 25, right? So you've got systolic hypertension. Now, in a one-day-old baby, you have systolic hypertension. In a six-month-old baby, you have systolic hypertension. So if the pressures are equal, what determines whether the shunt goes left to right or right to left? So what determines left to right flow is the pulmonary vascular resistance. So the pulmonary vascular resistance, and this is a very important point that in all VSDs, pulmonary artery pressure is high. They have severe pH at birth, at one month, at one year, at 100 years. But what determines left to right or right to left is the pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay, so what are the signs of low pulmonary vascular resistance? What are the signs of low PVR? Put them all in one row. Signs of low PVR. You want you can put symptoms and signs of signs. Of low, severe PS, low PVR. Signs and symptoms. So 
So failure to thrive and no weight gain that comes to the similar, right? Failure to thrive. So what what are those signs? What are the signs? Failure to thrive, low low weight gain. Okay. What are the other signs and symptoms? So symptoms could be frequent. What else? What is one? What are all the signs and symptoms of low pulmonary vascular resistance? What do you mean by that when you say CCF or you say respiration? What does it mean? Active recording, NBM. What else? Are you guys are struggling? This is going to be a basic question that will be asked. Which is, what are the signs of heart failure? If the patient has low pulmonary resistance with a large VOV, he is going to have a left right chance. What are all the signs of that? Symptoms, signs. Why are you even struggling with this? Or you are typing there? Because you have to say it in one long row, guys. Okay. You go. So when we talk about symptoms, it would be frequent less respiratory tract infection, not gaining weight, sweating with sleep, stuck rest, stuck cycles, right? Those would be symptoms. When we talk about signs and we talk about a low PDR, patient will be pink. We'll have an OT set more than 90%, right? We'll have a very active recordium. We may have retraction and tachypnea. When you put your stethoscope, you'll have a systolic ejection murmur. And a, likely an NDM or a gallop. So please remember systolic ejection murmur in a large VSD is also a sign of low pulmonary resistance because it tells you that blood is going left to right and across this pulmonary valve. So you don't get holosystolic murmurs in a large VSD, but the presence of a systolic ejection murmur is a, is before your MDM, see what happens from left ventricle, it goes to right ventricle, out to pulmonary artery. So first you get a systolic ejection murmur. Then all that blood comes to left atrium and across left ventricle. So then you get an MDM. So one of the first, you know, things that will disappear will be MDM. But if you have a systolic ejection murmur, that tells you that he's still got low pulmonary resistance. So you need to get in the habit of thinking like this. Okay, he's got low PVR, means he's got features, risky of heart failure symptoms, like sweating, failure to thrive, LRTI, he's thin, he's got a very, he's got refractions, that's his precordium, he's got a systolic ejection murmur, he's got an MDM and a gallop. So this is a patient with low pulmonary resistance, okay? And a patient with low PVR is always operable. Now, if a patient has these signs, but he also has a bounding pulse, which lesions do you think of? So, you think of PDA, yes, AC windows, any truncus, if they will have some sinuses, truncus. And that patient is operable as long as there is no aortic regurgitation. Okay? Now, I want you all to get this systolic ejection murmur because I notice everyone always gives MDM as their first answer. So, I'm going to, uh, what's called, perseverate on this point. See, this is your left ventricle. When you have a large VSD, right, so this is your right ventricle. When you have a large VSD, the pressures here are equal, right? But if pulmonary resistance is low, the shunt is going to go left to right and go out the pulmonary artery. So you will get a systolic ejection murmur here. Then the blood will come back to LA and go across mitral. So here you will get an MDM. Right? Now what happens when you have, let us say your left to right shunt is reducing. Right? So blood goes out pulmonary valve. So you have systolic ejection murmur. But there may not be so much left to right shunt to give you an MDM. So MDM doesn't, if MDM is there, yes, definitely patient is operable. But absence of MDM doesn't mean he's inoperable. Because, but absence of systolic ejection murmur is even more worrisome. Because if, once the left to right shunt becomes so little that you don't get a systolic ejection murmur at all, 
that's really worrisome so when you are asked the signs of approvability you got to include all this you know i notice everyone says kind of lrti failure to thrive hyperactive disorder in mdm but really your signs of approvability which is severe ph low pvr has to be failure to thrive sweating stress stuck cycle frequent lrti on exam patients they do things he has refractions active pericardium he's got a systolic ejection normal and plus minus a uh, mid diastolic normal okay so these are all your features of operability all clear on this okay so now we move to the next question if you have a patient who has severe pvr now he has low pvr with the previous slide that patient is really operable right now is the patient with high pvr is he inoperable is a patient with high pvr inoperable what do you think so not always right now these are the kind of patients we have to determine if they are operable or inoperable in progressive with a large vlg you have high flow high pressure pvr rises as the pvr gets higher the shunt becomes bidirectional or right to left and you will get signs of sinusitis but this patient may or may not be operable so now let's look at which features are worrisome for inoperability we want to now we have a patient with high pvr we have to decide who is operable who is not operable so which are the features of when a patient with a large vlg the these are worrying that this patient is inoperable can you name the symptoms signs So if it's blue, you're worried. Okay, what else? What desaturation level do you think? Like what stat worries you? Okay, stat 92. Some people will say 90. There should be less than 85. You would worry. Okay. So no, he has no symptoms. If he's gaining weight, he's got no infection. He's asymptomatic, and stat is less than 90. Right? No. He has a silent precordium, and he has no systolic ejection murmur, and no MDM, right? So if you see here, I have put no systolic ejection murmur because, as I said, MDM will go early. Once if you have MDM, you know for sure it's operable. But even if you don't have an MDM, if you have a systolic ejection murmur, it's operable. So if you have a patient with a fat less than 90 club, he's got a quiet precordium, who has no, he has silent chest, just a loud P2. no systolic ejection no more this this patient is worrisome for inoperability so now you are going to look at your test right so remember that e2 single or p2 loud uh, you are going to get in whether he has got high pvr or low pvr because in any patient with pulmonary hypertension you are going to get your loud banging second half sound so what determines that whether patient is what inoperability will be the pulmonary resistance so as the pulmonary resistance goes up vsd goes right to left you start getting blue you don't have your left to right feature so your precordium becomes quiet you don't have much left to right chanting so your ejection murmur and mdm all disappear right so now once you're worried you're worried that this patient may be inoperable how can you now determine inoperable versus inoperable by doing some diagnostic test so what are all the tests you will do What are the tests you will do? What is an active pressure dilator test? ECG. So first, I start with the simple answer. ECG. I would like to see his ECG, his X-ray, and his echo. Then you can decide on cap. Okay. So now let's go over a couple of ECG. Look at the first one on your left. Is patient operable or not? Listen.
look at the first one on your left. It could be, but if you see, he's got some. So he's got a right axis deviation. He's got RV forces. He doesn't have Q weight, right? But look, he also has some LV forces. We look at V6. He's got an R, right? We look at um, lead three. He's got some Q waves, right? So he, this is still a borderline ECG. Now look at your ECG on the right side. Here he's got right axis deviation. He's a pure R in V1. He does have an R in V6, but he's got significant RVH, and he has little bit of a Q, nothing much. So these would be very worrisome for inoperability. If you saw Q waves and you saw more biventricular forces, it would go more for maybe this patient is operable. Next, we look at an X-ray. This becomes very clear. The one on the left is. The one on the left is this one. Operable. He's got cardiomegaly. He's got plethora. The one on the right. He's got no cardiomegaly, and he's got pruning. So he's inoperable. So your X-ray here clearly is helping you differentiate. Next, what would you look for on your echo? Next, you're going to look at your echo. What do you look for on your echo? To suggest operability. What would you see on your echo that would make you feel I don't need a cat. This patient can go for VLG surgery. So what sun direction? So what what would you look three features? Okay, something which way? So you you are saying this patient is operable if sun is going mostly left to right. This is LALA LV are dilated and if he has increased pulmonary venous return. It has increased flow across his mitral valve. Before mitral valve, across his pulmonary vein. Yes. So these are the three features you need to look for for operability. And this applies to VSD, PDA, AV canal, anyone. Some will be primarily left to right. It may be bidirectional, but primarily or predominantly left to right. Now all. So I told you to go pulmonary valve. So you get systolic ejection murmur. It will come back to any. So you will have pulmonary venous return increase, and you will get LA LV dilation. Okay, LA LV dilation will be, which is what causes your MDM. That's all that blood coming back to the LA and going to LV is the cause of your MDM, right? So the exception that you need to remember is AV canal. It is AV canal because you've got a large atrial component, or a VSD with a large atrial ASD. You may not get the LALV dilation. So in an AV canal, what you will look for is that the shunt is going left to right, and the pulmonary venous return is increased. So even if you have RARV dilation, which you can see in an AV canal, the fact that pulmonary venous return is increased is a good sign that this patient has skin has low pulmonary resistance. When we say low pulmonary resistance, what do we mean? What do we mean by low pulmonary resistance? Less than what? Okay. When the cath lab, when we we say operable, the resistance is less than how much? What is the norm in the cath lab? In the cath lab, if you would take you could take patient to cath lab and say he is operable, what what is the resistance we look for? No, four, five, six, seven. Now we have all the answers. I thought standard is less than eight resistance units on oxygen, right? Is considered operable. Now, what is a normal pulmonary vascular resistance in you and me? What is our resistance? So one to two, right? One to two, two, two to three. This is normal resistance. If you start having four and five, then that's elevated resistance. If you have more than eight baseline, which doesn't drop, then that is inoperable, right? So, but you can see that in a VSD, you can have resistance ranging from two when you have significant heart failure to maybe five or six when you still got more left to right to eight when you're going to be more right to left. 
okay so this is just an example if you look at this vsd mostly left to right if you look at this vsd which is a subpalmonic vsd you can see that it is bidirectional right but you still get a sense that there's more red so it would be the second echo would be an example of bidirectional but predominant now if you look at this one it's again bidirectional but it is predominantly you get a sense that it is blue so it is predominantly right to left so this would be a little worrisome for you you can see la a or ratio la is not dilated palmar units which are not in c and similarly when you look at your pda this first one here on the right upper this one is all left to right right if you look at the lower one it is bidirectional this is a four chamber view lalv dilated so this would make you feel okay this patient even though he has a large vsd is operable see what type of vsd is this on this echo watch this vsd what what is the type of vsd what is the type of vsd so it is subaortic malaligned vsd also called eisenmenger type of vsd right because it is an overriding vsd so you think of tetralogy but then you need to tip up look you are tipping up so this is overriding aorta tip up further you see there is no pulmonary stenosis and pas are dilated so this is a malaligned vsd with aortic override this is what is your typical called eisenmenger vsd because these vsd will never close on their own right now this kind of vsd you would be very worried right does he have is he operable or not but if you look at his lalv they are dilated now why are they dilated as we discussed if you have pressures equal lv and rv and ca pressures are equal each pulmonary resistance is low blood will go from lv to rv to ca back to lalv so you get the solid ejection number mdm is a ca dilated lalv dilated okay now you must there is a caveat when we say that la lv dilation is a sign of an operable vsd it is in the absence of what two things la lv dilation is a sign of an operable vsd in the absence of mitral regurgitation and lv dysfunction so if you have mr that can make your la lv dilated without the patient being operable if you have ms la can be dilated without patient being operable if you have lv dysfunction la la and lv can be dilated without patient being operable so when you when we say la lv dilation is a feature of operability it is in the absence of mr and lv dysfunction okay generally lv oto they get more hypertrophic rather than dilated This is an example. You can look here on your four chamber view. The pulmonary venous flow. You just get that sense that there's a lot more flow coming back. If you look at my scale, my scale is set at 98. It's a very high nitrous limit, and yet pulmonary venous flow is increased. Now look at the mitral valve on this right. You see that little orange turbulence above the valve. You see that everyone sees it, right? Now what does that suggest when you have mitral inflow turbulence above the mitral valve what are the things that it can suggest so yes it can suggest a supra mitral membrane so it's very important when you look at your mitral valve inflows if you see here this is your four chamber view right and this is your mitral valve so this is lv here and if you saw in that echo we are getting turbulence somewhere here Right, we are getting turbulence here. When you get turbulence here, there are two things it can be. It can either be a supramitral membrane, there is some membrane there, or if there is no supramitral membrane, what is it? If you rule out supramitral membrane, what is it? So look at this image again. 
So I say, I, I get this turbulence above the mitral valve. It's not a mitral stenosis or a, uh, right? It's not a mitral valve issue. This turbulence is coming above the valve. So it is increased flow. Poetry after after, yes, but then you would see your, you know, you would see some obstruction in there which are not. So you think of sutra mitral membrane, you can look on 2D and you can make sure that you don't have a sutra mitral membrane. Assuming there's no supramitral membrane or four triatratum or anything causing this, this is a sign of increased flow. So when you see this kind of mitral inflow, increased flow, what does this represent with your stethoscope? What is the same thing in your stethoscope? It's an MDM, right? What is an MDM? It's this increased flow across the mitral valve. It's a midiastolic murmur, nothing else. It's a rumble, right? So, impressive pulmonary venous and mitral flow inflows are a very good feature of operability. They tell you that your pulmonary resistance is low enough that the blood is getting through the lungs and coming back to the left side. Everybody clear on this? And if you see this, you see how late this is, right? You imagine, let us go back, let's go back to this, sorry, let's go back to this, uh, this one that goes from LV to the VSD to the aorta and pulmonary artery. So, systolic ejection murmur and pulmonary artery dilated. You see pulmonary artery dilated. Then it goes through lungs, comes back to LA, then increase pulmonary initiative, then to mitral valve. And that's why your, uh, you know, MDM and LV dilation will be the first two that disappear. Then pulmonary venous return will disappear. Then systolic ejection will, murmur will disappear. Right? So that is kind of the way the blood has to flow. All clear on this? Okay, let me just go back to this one I saw. This one here, if you look at. Right? You can see, uh, I wanted to show you the LAAO ratio. See, look at the LA, I hope you all are measuring. Look at the LA compared to the aorta. The LA is dilated, right? So it's very important if it's borderline, just measure your LA in your ratio. And if it's, if it's LA is dilated compared to the aorta, more than 1.3 to 1, again, it's silver, dilated, less ratio. Diagnosis here. So this is a large AC window, right? You can see, and this is done actually from a very high short axis view. Uh, and this is a very good view, a high short axis view to not miss an AC window. Now, what is the echo features of operability of an AC window? Echo features of operability of an AC window. Put them in one row. Echo features of operability. So we said clinical features we already discussed of AC window, which is that we will have failure to thrive, increased LRTI, sweating, patient will be thin, will have active precordium, will be for kidneys, will have bounding pulses, will have a systolic ejection normal. Right? Okay, guys. When you are asked echo features of AC windows, you don't mention one thing, you're dead. Because we are only waiting for that one thing. So yes, they can have LALV dilation. Increase, yes, you have to put that in. Otherwise, you get zero marks for your other answers. That has to be put in, in when we talk about of an AC window. So reversal in the descending aorta. This, this point when you ask, and you don't, you don't have to start with that. The echo features of an AP window are, that, as you can see here, this one is going mostly left to right. This one you see is blue, it is going right to left. So the echo features are that the AP window will be going left to right, pulmonary venous flow will be increased, LALV will be dilated. 
and there will be reversal of flow in the descending aorta. Because please remember, the reversal of flow is a powerful predictor of operability. Because it suggests that pulmonary resistance is much lower than systemic resistance. So you can see here, this is your arch view. Now you see that little red flow, right? But it's not so clear. Look at my Nyquist limit. My Nyquist limit is set at 1.2, right? So when I turn my Nyquist limit down, it becomes clearer. You see the red flow coming back? Everybody see that? Please remember this image. This is flow reversal in the arch. Flow reversal in the arch is a sign of operability in an AP window. You show me a case of AP window and that patient is blue with a stat of 85% and he does not have reversal of flow, I would not send him to the operating room. It would be very, very high risk. So there are two features of AP window which are very important for operability. One is saturation. If they are sinus and club, lungs are damaged. If there is no reversal, very high risk. Okay? So look at this reversal of flow, please remember this. And this answer, reversal of flow on echo applies to AC window, applies to what else? Which lesion you must remember? The echo feature of operability. PDA would be reversal in the descending aorta, not in the arch, right? Truncus, truncus. Reversal of flow in the absence of truncal regurgitation is a good sign of operability. So, truncus without truncal regurg. Which other lesion? One more lesion, guys. The reversal in the arch. One more lesion. Reversal in the arch is a good sign of operability. One more lesion. AP window, truncus, one more lesion. I need something. Anomalous origin of the right or left pulmonary axis from the aorta. So when one of the PAs is coming from the ascending aorta, the same features apply. You must get in this habit in your head of knowing all the features and listing all the features of operability. Okay? You can see ascending aorta, got reversal, you have your systolic forward flow and then you have your blue reversal. You can also look at your scale, right? So you have systolic forward flow and then you have some, some coming back on the Doppler signal as well. So finally, inoperability on echo would be exactly the opposite, right? This you all know. Shunt would be predominantly right to left. You can see here. There will be evidence of right ventricular hypertrophy and dilation. There will be no NLV volume load. There will be normal or reduced pulmonary venous supply. So, this becomes your echo features of inoperability. So, what is called a D shaped LV. You look at this third image down here. Because the PDR is so high, the RV is so hypertrophy, it actually pushes the septum down and the septum moves down with the right ventricle. Then end stage, ultimately, patient comes with RV failure and of course that is the end stage and there is nothing that can be done at this point. So this is an example of a AP window with absence of flow reversal in the arch. You don't see any flow reversal. So AP window, hemi-trunctus, trunctus, you don't have flow reversal. Very worrisome for inoperability. Now, what is the role of a contrast echo and pH assessment? Is there any role of a contrast echo in pH? Say, patient, you are coming to you as loud C2 pulmonary hypertension. Would you ever do a contrast echo? So the pulmonary AV fistulae, yes. So they typically, the resistance is low in pulmonary fistula. They don't present so much as pH, yes, but they can. And it's good, you can pick that up. But if you want to rule out, if you've got a loud C2 and you're not seeing a shunt, so if you don't want to do a cat as the first step, you can look for a right to left shunt in which one? Things like PDA, AP window, right? 
So you do here, you tissue here, you do exit contrast, nothing is going into LALG. But contrast is coming into AOSA. That means there is no ASD, there is no VSD, right? But you've got filling of the AOSA. So that tells you you use some AC window or some weird AOSA pulmonary connection. And therefore, in TH patient, when you do a contrast echo, you should always do the second view, which is do your subcostal strategy, you open up your descending AOSA and look for a weird, anything weird. Like so. If you can see, it can't be an RPA LA fistula because nothing is filled even later, nothing is filled the LA. There is only a direct fill of the aorta. So it's either a PDA that you missed or an AC window or a many or some kind of aorto pulmonary connection which a contrast echo can help you pick up. Okay. So just as a quick recap, and this is when you are or when you think about a patient, what are the features of operability in a VSD? Heart failure symptoms, including failure to thrive, sweating, stuck rest, stuck cycle. Patient will be pink, OT sat more than 90%. Will have an active precordium, and you can have mild tachypnea. Will have a systolic ejection murmur, and maybe an NBM or a gallop. On ECG, will have Q waves and an LV force. On X-ray, cardiomegaly and plethora. On echo, a VSD going left to right. Left heart dilation, increased pulmonary venous flow. And PDA will have all of the above plus a wide pulse pressure. Is this clear? Please take a picture on your smartphone and I want you always mentally to go through this order when you are asked for features of operability. Not start off with MDM or start off with cardiomegaly. Right? You go in order. You go from symptoms to think, to precordium, to stethoscope, to ECG, to X-ray, to echo. Okay? All clear? And similarly, if you ask features of inoperability, you go the reverse way. Patient will be blue, fat less than 85 or 90 percent, clubbed. No signs of overcirculation, you will have a quiet precordium. ECG will have, and when I say no signs of overcirculation, that includes quiet precordium, no tachypnea, no systolic ejection murmur, no MDM, all the negative. ECG, no Q waves, because Q waves suggest volume load of the left ventricle, so no Q waves, RVH, X ray, normal heart size, no plethora, Rooney. Echo, shunt, predominantly right to left, evidence of RVH and RV dilation, no LV volume load, no increased pulmonary venous return, or you can say normal or reduced pulmonary venous return. In addition, AP window, all of the above, plus absence of flow reversal in the arch. So again, you have to do a mental checklist when you look at operability and inoperability, starting from symptoms. Moving to saturation, to recordial palpation, to to ECG X-ray, and this if you give this entire order, you will at the end of it know with the patient operable or inoperable. You very rarely need to go to your next line, which is what. So say you have a patient who has a quiet recording, no systolic ejection murmur, but you know what? The saturation is ninety percent. He has little bit of cardiomegaly on X-ray. His LVRV are equal. His shunt is left to right and right to left. with bi-directional. You are not sure. What would you do? <coughs> so this is the patient who would do a casting. So when you are asked, how do you assess operability in a patient? We start off with symptoms. I'll ask the symptoms. I'll examine him. I'll do a ECG, X-ray, and echo. Cat is not a needed in every patient. Only when, after your complete assessment, you are still not sure, then you are going to do a CAT. Okay, so I would like you all not to answer when you ask, how do you assess operability to say CAT? Because CAT is only done in a few percentage of cases. Operability is really a clinical, as a, a clinical examination along with ECG, X-ray, echo, and tell you an operable or inoperable patient in 95% of the patients. 
few cases we're going to do a cardio attack, and as we discussed, if you have less than eight resistant units with oxygen, or if you're using any other vasodilators like nitric oxide, if you have less than eight resistant units, it is considered operable. Now, all this should fit along, of course, with this physical exam and his echo because there are some caveats. Echo, a cat is not a hundred percent, right? We've got some issues in the cat class. And what are those controversies in the cat class? Can you tell me some controversies in our Indian cat lab setting? Why is it that these calculations are not a hundred percent? We don't fully trust our CAS RBUs. Why? Why? Okay, patient is sedated many times, they have anesthesia given, and we don't calculate, most CAS labs in India don't calculate the oxygen consumption. We all use, assume, in the US, all CAS labs actually calculate oxygen consumption. It's a more accurate assessment of PVR. Here, VO2 is not routinely measured. Are there any of you whose cat labs you actually measure VO2? Anyone? Say answer yes. Or do you all use assumed VO2? Anyone measures actually VO2 in Indian cat labs? Anyone? I know at NH we. Anyone at the any other centers? No? So you all, everyone is using the charts, right? Now, those charts are just assumed VOTs, right? The average VOTs. They may not be the VO2 of that patient. So, that is one issue. Second is most of the patients are done, we don't do it, we do it with anesthesia in India because we want them all quiet. Many of them, they don't have SAT machines. How many of you have SAT machines in your cat lab? Or does your sample go somewhere else? How many have SAT labs? Say yes if you have a SAT machine inside your SAT lab. And if you don't know, go check. You have a SAT machine in, inside the SAT lab. Right? So even at NH, I know we don't have it in the SAT lab. It goes up to third floor somewhere, somewhere. So there are issues with just your uh, sample assessment. Right? And secondly is, and then finally, even though 100% oxygen is given and we measure the PVR, right? There is, it is, there is some, it is questionable whether this really is a good predictor of operability. And therefore, even though we use cat lab and we say less than 8 resistance units, in practicality, there are some controversies. And that is why it is better to clinically assess. If the NH fellows will know, I'll always ask them the facts first. What is the baseline saturation? What is the baseline hemoglobin? When you're looking at your, you know, you're looking at the patient, and they have up there in your CAP data the hemoglobin. Always notice what the hemoglobin is. That's the first thing I look at. Because if his hemoglobin is 12, it's telling you he can't be really that cyanose. This guy must be pink. If his hemoglobin is 18, that means he must have a lower saturation, right? So the, the sensitivity and specificity of our CAP lab, yes, is not 100%. And therefore, yes, we do do CAT, but we need to also understand that there are, it's not just, you know, go to the CAT lab and it will sort it out. You've got to use clinical, ECG, X-ray, and echo to the best of your ability before going to the CAT lab. Okay? This procedure is useful in the CAT lab, and what is this procedure? So, a couple of other procedures or things you can do. To assess operability, this is what is this procedure, what has been done? This is balloon occlusion of the PDA. So you can see here that there is a large PDA, right? And if you are you're not sure of operability, you have one catheter in the pulmonary artery. Then you put your balloon in the descending aorta, bring it back across the duct. And with that catheter in the pulmonary artery, you are measuring the PA pressure. So, and you are also measuring aortic pressure. If you have a substantial fall, especially of PA diastolic pressures, it suggests operability. Then, and you can see here pre-occlusion, aorta and PA are the same. Post-occlusion, aorta has gone up a bit, which is good, and PA has dropped. So this patient is operable. If on the other hand, pulmonary artery pressure goes up, 
or aortic pressure drops, that is very, very simple in hospitality. Because that tells you is mostly going right to left. If his aortic pressure goes up and PA pressure drops, that tells you he is mostly going left to right. So now you swap the left to right front, so aortic pressure went up. Is that clear? We look at this here. The aortic pressure was 60, right? Now you block the PDA, so his left to right front dropped, so his aortic pressure went up. And because his PA pressure dropped down to 40, it is we know that now there is a big gap between aorta and PA. You know, as you close off this duct, he should at least drop his pressure down to about 40 45. Okay? Now, this is, there is a whole, you know, um, another discussion we can do which is on operability in cyanotic patients. Because if you see, we talked about if a patient with a VSD is cyanosed, that means he's you are worried about inoperability, right? So now what about a cyanotic heart disease? It is already cyanosed. So the, the difference between these two is that cyanosis does not exclude operability in all cyanotic heart disease. Whereas cyanosis makes them inoperable in a cyanotic heart disease. Am I confusing you? In cyanotic heart disease, if the patient is blue, they could still be operable. But there are a few cyanotic heart diseases where if the patient is blue, you are just as worried as you are worried with a patient with a VSD. Can you name those cyanotic reasons? Truncus? Yes. If the truncus is blue, you are worried about inoperability. Any other? And if a single ventricle type C is blue, you are worried about inoperability. These two, now you think about it. What are the five cyanotic heart diseases? What are the five cyanotic heart diseases? Name the five cyanotic heart diseases. Your C's, name the five C's. Put them in one line. Put the five cyanotic heart diseases in one line. Soft, PGA, PAPVC, Trunkus, Triapedia. Okay, now let's go over them one by one. Soft. The top is blue, anyway he doesn't have PA, you know he's operable. PAPVC, he's going to be the nature of the nature of lesion, he has some cyanosis, he's operable. Right? Then take TGA. If TGA is blue, what does it mean? That he has a mixing issue. A PGA VSD is a different subgroup, but generally your PGA intact septum or PGA ASD is blue. You expect that, you're going to be in cross examine. But look at trunks and triatresia. Triatresia with increased CP, obviously. Triatresia type C. So these two initially have increased pulmonary blood flow. So they present with tachypnea, active precordium, respiratory infection, all the features of overcirculation. Now remember that the trunks in a single ventricle, they won't necessarily have 100% saturation. Because trunks also have mixing of blood in the trunk. Diatresia has mixing of blood. By the time it comes to LV, you have RA and LA blood mix. So they will not have 100% saturation. But in the early phases of a truncus and single ventricle, they will actually have taken as saturation 93-94%. But if a truncus or a triatresia single ventricle high QP situation comes to you with a saturation of 70%, 75%, you are worried about an operability. That means you develop pulmonary vascular damage. Okay? Yes, so truncus type C basically, I mean triatresia type C and truncus, those are the ones you would worry about. Okay? So I think I'll end with that. You know, I think there's a whole thing on PGA VSD, but that, that will be another whole discussion and it's already nine. So I'll end with that. I, I, you know, I uh, may be able to do uh, the EIC class tomorrow, uh, but I'm not sure of the time yet. It depends on a couple of things, so I'll email you all. Okay? Ciao, ciao, and I'll email you next week's schedule.